Recommendations 2023 Reports Press Conference. We are pleased to see you both here in Harpa Reykjavik and online. My name is Nina Okod and I'm Head of Communications of the Nordic Council of Ministers. We will hear three short presentations before we take questions from the media. We will start with an introduction of the Nordic Nutrition Recommendations 2023 by the Secretary General of the Nordic Council of Ministers, Karen Elemann, followed by the Global Perspectives by the Director for the UN Food System Coordination Hub and FAO Office of Sustainable Development Goals, Stefanos Futiu. And to present the results of the report, we have with us the professor and the project lead for the report, Rune Plunhoff from the Oslo University. After all the three presentations, we take questions both, both from this room and from online participants. And now, Karen, please. Thank you very much. Good morning and welcome to Harpa here in Reykjavik and to the press conference marking the launch of the new Nordic Nutrition Recommendations, the NNR 2023. I'm very happy to see members of the press here at Harpa, but also I wish to greet all of you who have joined us online. As said before, my name is Karen Elliman and I'm the Secretary General of the Nordic Council of Ministers. And it is honestly a real personal highlight for me to be here today to introduce the launch and to celebrate the hard work that has gone into this publication. NNR 2023 is now published after five years of research analysis and writing. Today is a historical day for the Nordic Corporation. It's a real milestone in our 40 plus years of working together to collate and share the best and most recent scientific data on nutrition for healthy eating. For the first time, we are today presenting scientific recommendations not only for our health, but for the health of the planet. Science is clear. We need to change our consumption. The NNR 2023 will be the tool to make that possible. I think that many has the view of people in the Nordics living rather healthy lives, eating quite well, taking our bike to work, and hiking in our beautiful nature. The reality, however, is that we are grappling with increasing levels of obesity and diet-related illnesses. The new NNR 23 shows that if we change our eating habits in a few concrete ways, it will have a positive impact on our health. Eating more whole grains, less meat, and keep processed meat and foods at an absolute minimum. We have an indisputable scientific evidence that what we eat impacts the environment and contributes to climate change. I know that I'm not the only one feeling worried and quite frankly overwhelmed when I read reports warning us that we are heading towards thresholds that should not be crossed if we are to keep living in a livable world. No one can do everything, but we can all do something. And our food choices are an excellent place to start. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And uh, Stefanos, put you, please. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning from my side. And, uh, very big thanks to the Nordic Council for inviting me here. I'm also worried because when we see the global situation on food security and nutrition, the news are not good at all. Uh, we know from the latest studies of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations that 828 million people, they cannot uh, 
uh, fulfill their hunger. 3.5 billion people, they cannot afford a healthy diet worldwide. And about 150 million people, uh, 150 million kids, they are actually stunted. So unfortunately, these are numbers that they have not been improved the last years. And something that we see from the global situation on food security and nutrition is that we started to have some gains uh, from 2015 when the Sustainable Development Goals started. But then we had a combination of crises, the COVID-19 crisis, the ongoing crisis of climate and biodiversity, and of course the war in Ukraine that intensified the situation. And today we're in a path that by the year 2030, the milestone for the 2030 agenda and the SDGs, we'll have the same amount of hungry people all over the world that the ones we have in 2015. But at the same time, we are hopeful because we know that there are solutions. And one of the most important solutions we have identified is, of course, a shift in diets towards more healthy diets. And this is because of three main reasons. One is the very big mitigation potential that this shift could have for our planet. And it can save millions of tons of CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions. The second is the very big uh, benefit that we can have on the health of the people. And the third, of course, is that by shifting on more uh, balanced diets, we will change the way that agricultural production is happening and the food is produced. So we can have a situation where we have three wins for the planet, for the people, for the economy, and this can happen by changing our food systems. And this is a realization that has started happening the last years, and this is why the food systems and nutrition has been identified by the United Nations as one of the six acceleration areas for the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda. And the world came together two years ago in 2019 in the UN Food System, 2021, I'm sorry, in the UN Food System Summit and identified that we need uh, pathways to transform our food systems to become more sustainable, more resilient for the future. This year in, in Rome, in about one month from now, 24 to 26 July, we will take stock of what the world is doing on achieving their food system transformation pathways. And we are very sure that the Nordic Council will present a fantastic case there on how collective action, how multilateral action, how action by all countries, by governments, together with the civil society, the citizens, the private sector, can really create the case of food system transformations. So we really welcome, uh, we are looking forward to see you in July, and of course, uh, a very big honor to be here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Rune uh, Thank you. So um, it's really great pleasure to uh, present to you a very brief uh, summary of the NNR 2023 today that is published today. Um, the, as you know, the, the report, is, it's an extensive report. The total report, the extended report, is about uh, 2,000 pages. That will be avail available early fall. The summary report, around 400 pages, is what is presented today. The NNR um, committee is the sole responsibility for the te text and language and the recommendation and advice in the, N in the NNR report. So what is important for you to remember is that our report is science advice to authorities in those eight countries. Then the eight countries, authorities, should then implement this in their national regulations and policies. So, and then I think it's also really important for you to know what is included and what is not included. What's included in the report is updated nutrient recommendations. We have also included a framework for national dietary guidelines based on both on the effect of diet consum food consumption on health and the effect of the environmental impact of our food consumption. What has not been included is other dimensions that are related, such as food production, self-sufficiency, food security, food safety, animal welfare, social cultural aspects, and many other aspects. Those aspects need to be dealt with locally in each individual country. So this report involves health and environment.
So, um, as was said just a minute ago, the, there is increasing evidence that a predominantly plant-based diet is really what is good for both the health and the planet. And some of the elements here is that the predominantly plant, or the main conclusion from the overall report, is that we advise a predominantly plant-based diet high in vegetables, fruit, berries, pulses, potatoes, and whole grains, ample intake of fish and nuts, limited intake of red meat and poultry, moderate intake of low-fat dairy products, and minimal intake of processed meat, alcohol, and processed foods containing high amounts of fats, salt, and sugar. So this includes, and the reason for these formulations of guidelines is both environment and health. We have been very specific what is based on health and what is based on environment. And for all advice, none of these advices are in conflict with health. Health is always uh, considered first, then we adjust the guidelines so that it also can improve the, or reduce the environmental impact. So more specifically, <coughs> here is a short presentation of what is based on health and what is based on environment. We have an advice on, uh, on, uh, on increasing the amount of, uh, of uh, intake of fruit and vegetables and berries to five to 800 grams uh, per day. Eat a variety of vegetable fruits and berries. And that is based both on arguments from health and environment. The same with cereals. Consume at least 90 grams per day of whole grains. Pulses, significant part of the regular diet. When there is a clear dose response curve, then we, ha we, we formulate quantitative guidelines. If there is a convincing evidence, strong evidence, but not uh, available, a, cl a very clear dose response, we have qual qualitative guidelines, such as pulses. For nuts, 20 to 30 grams per day. Fish, 300 to 450 grams per week of fish from sustainable managed stocks. And then we also have uh, potatoes. And potatoes, the main argument for including increased consumption of potatoes and include it as a significant part of the regular diet is environmental reasoning. Then moderate consumption, which is based on both on health and environment, milk and dairy from 350 to 500 grams per day or milliliter per day. And the main reasoning for that is that they are important sources of nutrients, some essential nutrients that we need. And it's not quite easy in the Nordic and Baltic diet to get those nutrients from other sources. So that is the, the reason. And that is also, we say that if, if included from other sources, those nutrients, it would be beneficial for the environment to re reduce milk beyond these levels. Then we uh, suggest that um, we should reduce the consumption of red meat. There is a very clear dose response curve uh, up to that increase the risk of colorectal cancer around 350 uh, grams per week. So we suggest that the, the maximum amount of, th of, of, of red meat should be 350, but preferentially should it be considerably lower due to environmental consideration. Sweets, a limited consumption, processed food and high in, high in, in fat, salt and sugar, also a very limited consumption. For alcohol, no safe limit, lower limit. Previously, it was uh, suggested that low alcohol or moderate alcohol could have beneficial effect reducing the risk of cardiovascular diseases. This type of, of, of research has been weakened the, the last decade. So today, there is the recent evidence do not suggest a protective effect of alcohol on cardiovascular diseases. On the contrary, 
There is an increased risk of, of cancer that has been strengthened considerably in the last few years, and there is no lower limit for, for alcohol consumption. Processed meat as low as possible. All of those are arguments are, are, are based both on health and environmental arguments. And then on white meat, we, we say that uh, we could have preferentially lower intake than, than, than today based on environmental uh, reasoning. However, the health effect of, of, uh, of uh, white meat is more or less neutral. <coughs> So, so that is the food-based dietary guidelines. Our recommendations for food-based dietary guidelines in the Nordic and Baltic countries. <coughs> then it comes to the nutrients. And the new version of NNR is a complete recalculation of all nutrients. For the first time, all nutrients have been recalculated in NNR 2023. So we have recommendations for 34 nutrients based on extensive systematic literature and front-edge methodology. And some nutrients receive uh, dietary reference values for the first time, such as vitamin K, biotin, pantothenic acid, choline, magnesium, manganese, molybdenum, and fluoride. So they, for the first time, have dietary reference values in NNR. And due to the recalculation and the updated methodology, there are also uh, many changes for, for, the, for the other nutrients. Many, many have small changes, but there are also a few that have rather large changes. And those changes that are more than 20% is vitamin E, vitamin B6, folate, B12, vitamin C, calcium, thiamine, zinc, and selenium. <coughs> so this is a very brief um, uh, summary of the, of the extensive report. Now we have delivered our report, and I think it was uh, very brave that Nordic Council of Ministers uh, five years ago uh, commissioned the report, not only updating nutrient uh, recommendations, but also specific diet guidelines on different food groups, and most importantly, report that integrate environmental impact of our food consumption. So now we have submitted the report, and now it is up to the national authorities in eight countries to implement and formulate policies in accordance with the framework. And we are waiting anxiously to see how this framework will be implemented. And I also know that the world is watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now we open for questions. When you get the word, please state your name, the media you represent, and to whom you address your question. And if you are participating from online, so please use the raise hand function. So do we have a first question? No? Okay. But then um, I will ask a question here to start with, um, and this is to actually everyone to, to start, but if we start with you, uh, Stefanos, what potential do the results of the report hold, if you think a little bit holistic? You mentioned economics and uh, maybe some other thoughts. I, I, I see three potential um, impacts here. Mm. One is in the Nordic countries themselves. So um, it is something that you can change your agricultural production scheme, it can create benefits for the people, it can create benefits for the environment. At the same time, given the extensive relations, international relations and trade relations that the Nordic countries have with the developing world, I see a, a spill-off effect, a positive spill-off effect, and I think that's quite important. And um, when we see, for example, that um, countries that they have done a lot of research uh, and all these recommendations are based on uh, extensive literature review, you said. There's a very good uh, global best practice and case study that, that, that can be presented. The third I would say is that when you have this discussion about these uh, nutrition recommendations, you start a very big discussion on how this would be achieved. So 
we and, and it would be achieved, I think, with both looking at the production and the consumption side. And uh, I must say here, I'm, I'm talking about one of the things that I'm most passionate for. There's this goal, the goal 12, and the sustainable development goals, the sustainable consumption and production. So we, we look at, at both sides of the problem, creating the solution. So the impact to the consumers and the change of the lifestyles that this could have for the consumers could be a trigger, actually, for the companies to start uh, changing the way that they're producing, uh, they're distributing, and they're advertising uh, food. So, and, and for me, this impact at the lifestyle and the way that people do the, uh, live their daily lives could be the most important impact of such, uh, uh, of such effort. Thank you. Any reflections, Rune? Do you want to comment on that? I, I, I think a report like this uh, call for uh, global harmonization and collaboration. Uh, very few countries have uh, resources alone to do th things like this. And we have communicated quite a lot with the authorities, almost every region in the world, during production of this, um, this report and development, especially on methodology and the principles. So I think that there is a huge possibility to, to share resources and improve quality if we have more global harmonization and collaboration. Thank you. Karim. I'm just saying that, that this is, as said before, it's a brave step that we are combining the two. And the latest, the last report was downloaded approximately 300,000 times. I think this one is going to be <coughs> downloaded a lot more because this is, this is what we need. Millions. Mm. Thank you, Anna. Now, now I look uh, to our online. Yeah, we have one question from online, uh, which is why are you not discussing pork together with red meat and poultry? Pigs live on high protein food that could be used for human food, and we can also reduce the soy import from Brazil and the Amazon area if we eat less pork. Mm. Yeah. We have been very specific. We discussed food consumption and um, environmental impact of the present consumption. Different import, export, um, production methodology is not part of our report. Mm -hmm. Of course, we describe it as a general background. But that is the next step. So that is up to the politicians and the authorities to, to see how that can be improved. Our report is based on present, uh, present uh, food production systems. Any more questions? Any questions from the ARPA? No? Okay, then I have uh, one more question. Um, so, what do you think happens or should happen next? Now we have the report, we have the fantastic uh, starting point. Well, I think a lot of what's happening right now is what we are going to see moving on. And that's the debate. The debate is going on now, and, and that's a good sign. I mean, there's a lot at stake here. So, of course, there is a very active debate. It was already taking place uh, during the hearings, of course. This is a Nordic way of doing things. We are strong democracies. We have this transparent process, and that makes sure that we have the debate. And then, of course, I mean, we expect that, that our countries are, are going to, to, to work with this report to make sure that now they look into the national recommendations and the, the, natural, the, the national advice. Yeah. When I'm thinking about next, I'm thinking um, what we do now in the UN about the food system transformations. And in the meeting that we'll have in July, we said that we have three objectives there. The first is convene countries and stakeholders to start thinking about solutions. And I think this is, you have done it already. You have done this convening, and it's very important what you also said, that countries came together, they share experience, they share research, they, said they, they share their, um, their, their studies, and they have come up to recommendations. Now there are two other objectives we have, and I think that these are two other steps. The second objective we have is to socialize the 
powerful role of the food system transformations for SDG acceleration. And I think socialization of this study will be extremely important. And I do hope that you have not th thousands of hundreds, but millions of downloads. But I think it's a continuous kind of work with the people, with the civil society, with the private sector to understand what is behind this. Because I must say that what's happening in this situation is that some vested interest will say, no, we want to challenge this, but, but this socialization will help, you will help them to become really the norm. And the third is to advocate for action at scale. So this will not happen with small pilots and if uh, a couple of families or a couple of industries will be interested. It needs to go to the millions of the Nordic people and to the thousands of farmers and to the corporations and to the companies you have. And this advocacy for action at scale, it will really require, I think, to bring together different means of implementation, finance for sure. So I think it's going to be quite important to have a step to see what it will take from a financial and investment point of view to make this the norm for all Nordic people. Governance, of course, and then capacity development and continuous uh, uh, research, data, and, and knowledge management. There has been a lot of debate already, mm. and more will come, I'm sure. And that is what we have invited. Uh, we have, been a very, we have had, uh, designed a very open uh, process. We have had uh, public consultation for one and a half year of more than 60 publications background publications. So we really like this type of openness and transparency. And we have, uh, there has been, uh, we have also, through this process, we have received a lot of extremely um, e e excellent questions um, so that we can improve the science, the messaging, the communication, and improve the language. Uh, so, so I think this democratic open process is really important to increase, increase the quality of the final report. And uh, I like this type of openness. And then, of course, there will be a lot of political debate, and that is very welcome. Thank you. I think we have one more question. Yes, uh, yes so the UN has several times pointed out that the ocean as a more important area to get our food from. Has this report strengthened that? And then connected to that question, we have a second question about if you could give an example of what sustainable fish stocks, uh, what, what are those? What, how do you define sustainable fish? Yeah. It's a difficult question, it's a large question, and it is uh, discussed in our background papers. So I would suggest that uh, the interested person would go into those background papers and, and look at those definitions and de those details. It's an extremely large and complicated issue, but important issue, of course. Kay. Yes, please. Yes, my name is Ostwalter. I'm from Bindablai, Icelandic Farmer newspaper. Uh, my question is, since you recommend less dairy, red meat and poultry, will that not be negative for farmers and the self-sustainability of the Nordic countries? Mm. Bruno, maybe you take I can, I can uh, um, respond to that. Um, that is, um, that is something we do not consider. We report on the food consumption, impact of food consumption. Next step is to see how can this be implemented in the Nordic countries, locally, in a local context, in the various countries, which are quite different. So, um, but there is a huge potential also in the Nordic countries to increase the production of plant foods. Uh, so I think this will be a very interesting discussion that we can start with now. How can we really transform the food system, the food production system, also to improve um, the production of the, the plant that is healthy, the, the food that is healthy, and also to reduce the environmental impact? Thank you. So I think that we just have a time for a couple of more. You had a question from online? 
Yeah, we have a lot of questions coming in online now. One, I don't, know, I don't think we will be able to answer all of them, but we can say that we have a research webinar after this as well, where some of these questions will also be able to be answered. But we have one last question here to Rune. If you could describe which environmental factors that are included and why they were chosen. So, uh, of course, climate is important. Uh, climate is important, and that is a major factor, of course. It's a major environmental threat to um, the, the global uh, warming. But then we have also included a number of other, like uh, biodiversity, land use, fert fertilizers, etc., etc. So there is, they all, we, what we have done is to, to search in the literature and summarize what is present in the literature. So we have, we have not been selective when it comes to environmental. We have been inclusive and included, included all those papers that are relevant to the food production system. Thank you. And uh, I think that was it from uh, the press conference part. And as said, we have a webinar coming up just in a few minutes. So thank you all. <laughs>